and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Israel, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnants that still survive. And when King Hezekiah officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the kings of Assyria have blasphemed me, blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country. And there I will cut him down with the sword. But could it be? Could it be that this is the day of distress and rebuke as when children come to the birth canal and there is no strength to deliver them? Wow. Let us think on the words, I believe, prophets, propaganda, and the promise of a future. Amen. Prophets, <laughs> propaganda, and the promise of a future. Could it be that the children have come to the birth canal but there is no strength to bear them? It is my colleague Walter Brueggemann, the author of the now classic text, Prophetic Imagination, who says that prophets are involved in two impossible tasks. One, leading people in mourning the loss of everything they knew and loved. And two, helping them to imagine the unimaginable and the better future God has for them on the horizon. Can I say that again? Yes, ma'am. The prophets have two impossible tasks. One task is to help people grieve and mourn and lament over what they are about to lose. But the prophet's task is also to help people to imagine and embrace a better future that God has on the horizon. Yes. Now let me be clear. I said prophets because this is chapel at a Christian-based college. But if I were talking to an audience made up of college teachers who teach literature, like the Modern Language Association made up of college professors who teach literature at colleges around the country, I would not have said to them, prophets have the uh, impossible task. I would have said, poets. Yeah. Mm. I would have been talking to English literature professors and they have no interest in prophets, but they would understand that poets have the twin task of leading people to grieve over what they're losing and to embrace the unknown future. <laughs> and if I were talking down the street at Music City to musicians, I would have said not prophets, and I would not have said poets. I would say songwriters have the two impossible tasks. And that is finding language that helps people both grieve over what they're losing and look forward to what they're about to gain. That is because prophets are not the only ones who have the burden of getting through the fog and the days that clouds people's minds. Yeah. Yeah. Prophets and poets and artists and writers and novelists all have, all have, all have what some call the third eye. Mm -hmm. Their job is to see past the fog. 
and to see past. And, and because I'm at a Christian a chapel and Christian students, we, we talk about prophets. But, I, but, but looking the other night at the talent show and the, the poets and the singers and, and the performances here, we recognize that prophets are not the only ones who use language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Remember, those of you who had Old Testament survey with me, there is a reason why King Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. carted off into exile not only the royal family and the royal officials, but if you will remember, those of you who had Old Testament survey either with me or with Professor Dickerson and Professor Tribble, you recognize and remember that, that Nebuchadnezzar did not just take did not just take Jehoiakim and his family, did not just take Jehoiakim and his family and the royal, but he also took the prophets and he also took poets and he also took musicians and he also took composers. And we always ask, well, why did, because they are the ones with the power, with the language, with the poetry to foment a revolution. It is, uh, they are the ones who know how to use language to make people wake up, everybody. No more sleeping in bed. Uh, they are the ones that if you cart off the artists and the musicians and the songwriters and the prophets and the preachers, if you cart them off and you leave the neighborhood naked without anybody to use language. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning was this, the power of language and words and here this 8th century prophet Isaiah urges trust that God will bring something new and something beautiful out of chaos and grief and trauma. It is the task of prophet after prophet to tell people, to remind people that yes, it is hard now. Yes, now you're experiencing pain. And yes, now there is destruction. And yes, now there is devastation. And yes, now you will probably lose everything that you have ever known to be true. But if you just hold out, yeah. and keep the faith yeah. God will do wondrous things they that wait on the Lord shall renew it is enormously important that the prophets will you say with me the prophets, the prophets. that the prophets of old spoke in poetic language by that I do not mean they created rhymes, rather that they spoke in elusive metaphorical ways as a rhetorical strategy of challenging the, the ideologies of their day. When I was growing up, we, we, when we did not want our parents to know what we were talking about, we talked in Igpe Adelaide. Physique <laughs> Lizatzatin. <laughs> It was an underground language. It was metaphorical language. It was a way to make sure that the powers that be, mama and dad and them, did not know what we were saying and what we were talking about and that we were going to slip out the window in the middle of the night and go to a little party. So, I, 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 so you were, it was an underground language. Poetry is language that is underground language. The language that is challenging the dominant structure. The language that the powerful are not supposed to understand. Uh, because the powerful are more concerned with data. And the powerful are more concerned with empirical evidence. And the powerful are only interested in linear thinking. And the powerful is only think, thinking about the dominant language. But the poet comes and says, listen. The babies have come to the birth canal. And there is no strength to bear them. Oh, oh you got to be a prophet to even un you got to know poetry. You got to love poetry. You got to love language. You got to love sentences. Oh, God knows if we could just get you to love sentences. If you could just love words. Ah, well, we're talking, we're trying to argue against the kind of empty preaching and the empty language. Ah, but if you hear, when you hear words, I, I think our English teacher here is Miss Corder, amen. Put your hands together for Miss Corder. She, she works so hard. She works so hard. She,
<laughs> the pop, uh, it, it, you have never read a sentence and said, I wish I had written that sentence. Many years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I wanted to be a novelist. I never wanted to be a minister or an administrator. I wanted to write novels. And I read Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Pauli Marshall. And I read Virginia Woolf. And I read Margaret Walker and, and Brooks. And I, Gwendolyn Brooks. And I, and I read... Langston Hughes and I. Oh, I wanted to be a writer and the ways in which language arrested me and the ways in which I heard sentences and, and, and I could not sleep and I, and I wished and I wanted to know how did he or she craft that sentence right there. And Lot's wife looked back. Mm. And she became a pillar of salt. One sentence. And Jacob loved Rachel, but despised Leah. One sentence. There will be those who will deliver you up to be killed, thinking that they are doing the will of God. One sentence. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled. One sentence. That just. I remember when I fell in love with all that I might know him. In the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. I'm talking about my Pentecostal days now. When I cared about the Bible like that. In various times and in sundry ways, God spoke to them. Now this is in the King James language. I don't read King James no more. I'm an NIV girl now, but oh, there are some things that only can be said in King James. Verily, verily, I say unto you. That, that ain't the sermon, but I just got carried away there. Got the lips. Got the lips. Got the lips. Children have come to the birth canal. But there is no strength to bear them. Here Hezekiah sends word to Isaiah that after the Assyrian Rabshakeh or military my military officer had sent word to the people of Israel that be not be not deceived that your God has given us permission to destroy you. And if I have destroyed all the other nations and all the other lands on my way to get you, what make you think I'm not going to get you? And so the scripture says that outside the city gates of Jerusalem and Judea, there uh, the people are hearing the propaganda. Will you say with me the propaganda? Uh, the fear mongering, the propaganda, the alternative language of your enemies that, that come to instill fear in you and to make you scared and to make you think that your God is not an awesome God who comes to make you think that you're nothing and that God has ordain the powers that be to crush your little small school. I'm talking about propaganda. I'm talking about fear mongers. I'm talking about those who sit on the television station and stand in the presidential campaign and, and involved in debates and they uh, traffic in fear mongering. We 
you say with me, fear mongering. I'm talking about those who use language to intimidate and those who use language to demoralize and those who use language uh, uh, to scare you and those who use language to keep you in a little small place and those who use language to make you think you're stupid and you're dumb and you'll never be anybody. Oh, but I hear the word of God today say that if anyone be in Christ, that one is a new creation. Talking about, I'm talking about propaganda, and at the heart of propaganda is fear mongering. Great poetry inspires life, uh, uh, propaganda inspires fear. Great poetry inspires new possibilities, uh, uh, propaganda uh, in, in, in inspires small minded thinking. And, and so the rap shekel stands outside of Judah and wants the people to hear in their own language. Uh, uh, what he's going to do to him, them, and, and what the Assyrian king has in store for them, and, and, and Hezekiah, to his, to his, uh, to his credit, uh, does not is not it does not cower, but but he is scared. Will you say with me? It, it's all right to be scared. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it, it's human to be scared. It, it's human. But I love Hezekiah because uh, Hezekiah at least confronts the enemy. Uh, in, in front of the enemy, he looks strong, but when he gets back to his palace, he's a little scared. Uh, I think I quoted to you before something that T.D. Jake says. Well, you've got to stand before people and say, we're going to take the city. Even though you've got to go back to your pastor's office and say to yourself, how the hell are we going to take the city? Yeah! <laughs> but when you stand before the people, you got to say, thus says the Lord. Even if in your heart you say, Lord, are you sure thus says the Lord? Oh, but you got to preach it until you believe it. you got to preach it until you know it down in your heart. you got to preach it until God makes it so. But in the meantime, come on and put your hands together and give God some praise. It's ain't about whether you feel it, you got to say it until you feel it. You don't say it because you feel it, you got to say it until you feel it. You don't get up in the church and say, I will lift up my hands because I feel. God, I won't lift up my hand because you're a good God. I don't feel like lifting my hand, but I won't tear my hand. You're going to lift yourself to God because God has been too good. You don't do it because you feel it, because God is good. Oh, it's called fear mongering. That's what the propagandists do. That's what those of the empire do. They, they make us feel. They make us feel as faculty. They make us feel as administrators. They make us feel as students that we are nothing here at this college, that we'll never be anything. And so they put us under tight restrictions and, and they give us money and then they tell us we can't spend it on what we need to spend it on. And, 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 and then they, they trip you up and they put you in, I'm just going to keep on talking to my own self. Uh, they, give you, they, give you, they give you loan money and then they, try, then they say, uh, uh, don't, don't spend it on nothing but what we say you're supposed to spend it on. Even though they know you're poor, they know you don't have no money, they know you need it, and then they put in restrictions. It's called propaganda. Yeah. 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 Propaganda is what fear mongers do. They make you feel afraid. They make you tell you that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. They tell you that we got to close all the mosques and keep all the Muslims out. They tell us that we got to uh, uh, show up the, up, up the, up the borders and, and keep all, all those Spanish people from the south of the border out. It's called fear mongering. They, they, it's called, we, when we get in, in we got to take back America. Uh, because that Negro president has taken away America. Come on here, somebody. It's called propaganda. Come on here, somebody. Even though under this president, more has been done than has been done in decades. But propaganda! Yeah. Propaganda yeah. Yeah. is what the rap shaker was involved in outside. But I, but but I hear Hezekiah that who wants to who wants to believe uh, he's he's at least stands before the rap shaker with courage. But but he has this imagery. He has this imagery that I. I, 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 Dr. Harris, I know as a, as, a, as a man you preach it, but as a woman we preach it a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, that the babies have come to the birth canal. Yeah. Could it be that the babies have come 
that, that God, well, God, I, I hear you, God, I, I believe you, God, I know that you are the God of Israel, I know that you are the God of Judah, I know that you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I'm here to tell you, go tell Isaiah, or uh, go tell him that the, that the children, that, that we've gotten to a place in our walk with God, uh, that we've listened to our enemy for so long, and we've listened to false news for so long, and we've listened to MSNBC so long, and we've been on Twitter so long, and, and we didn't li listen to Facebook so long that right now we are kind of exhausted. Anybody in here know what it is to have justice fatigue? Come on here, somebody. Justice fatigue. That if I open, if I turn on my Facebook one more time, I feel like my God, we're going to hell in a handbasket. I feel like there's no hope. This one just been killed. That one just been killed. This one put in jail. That one put in jail. This one done this. And then and I become justice fatigue. And I feel like the babies have come to the birth canal. But I ain't got no strength to push. I want to believe. I want to trust God. I, I want to see God. But I ain't got no strength to push. Now listen, listen. Listen, listen. Listen, listen. Now, in a generation that only no male metaphors. <laughs> Dr. Weems' dissertation was on the sexual violent imagery in the Old Testament. My dissertation was about the prophet's use of, of, of women as whores and, and, uh, and Goma as a, as a wanton woman uh, to describe the justice of God. And, and, and it's impossible to preach in this pulpit for decades and, and you never hear anything about birthing images uh, because we know about God as a judge and we know about God as, as, as a bastard basketball and a football player. We, we know about God as a lawyer and we know about God in male imagery. Oh, but I come today to talk about God as a midwife in, in a person room. You ain't never been no judge and you ain't never been no lawyer. But everybody up in here got one thing in common. We done all been in the birth canal. You not you you are not LeBron James and you ain't no football player. But we done all come. And you should not have to be a woman. You should not have to be a woman to understand this imagery. Do I have a witness in here? There's a 23 year old girl outside this window here. And 23 years ago on January 18th, is she in here? I was going to be delivered of child. I was not a virgin, but I was going to be delivered of child. And, and, and we decided on January 18th because I had been carrying her for a long time. And my grandmama and them say I was as big as a government mule. That means a government mule has eaten and eaten and eaten. I was big. I was big. And I had, t and I, we had promised that that if the baby didn't come on, on that weekend, that, that the doctor said that we will we will induce labor. Yeah. Yeah. But I had told uh, Espinosa that I I, I want to go natural. <laughs> I don't want no epidural. I am a natural woman. Yeah. Come on, women. We we going here. We going. We going. We going to arrest the brothers today. You see, I, I, I'm convinced that there was a reason why Isaiah used this image because Isaiah understood birth imagery. Isaiah was the son of two sons, and the Bible said, and he was married to a prophetess. You know, the deaconess is married to the deacon, but she ain't no deacon. Oh, but the prophetess is a prophet. Come on here, somebody. She got credentials on her own. And 
Isaiah knew this image because he had been there in the birthing room of the prophetess and he understood the power of birth and the different stages of birth and he understood that the baby can get to the birth canal but if you don't have no strength to bear down and push I felt a little pinch and since I never had a baby before I didn't know what the pinch was it was just a pinch ah, about one o'clock oh, Clinton had been made president by then and I was a little cross-eyed right about that time oh, but I was going natural and Espinosa leaned over and said you sure you are? I, I got this I got this and there I was at about, what was it, about four o'clock, I tell you, I was grabbing on, on the hands. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Don't be 
afraid. Come on, everybody, and say push. Come on and give God some praise. I see you in the future. And your future looks good. Bro! 